welcome to the Sunday session. My name is Steve Judge. I'm the host for the Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners from around the world. Um, today, I've got two leading practitioners with us, one from Germany, Adam Bevan and Kevin McGreskin from Scotland. Before I uh, introduce you to them fully for today's discussion on a technological approach to training perception, I'm just going to share my screen with you and give you an idea of the format for today's discussion and how you can filter in your questions to Kevin and Adam. So in the first half, as always, will be a discussion of two halves. Let's kind of look at the, the key pillars of Kevin as a, as a coach and his approach to training perception. And then um, from Adam, uh, his research into the effects of the football nought at, uh, at Hoffenheim. Um, then we'll sort of talk a little bit more about his research and, and sort of how things are developing at Hoffenheim and, and maybe sort of introduce a little bit more on the helix and, and where that is. And then in the second half, we'll look more directly at the technological and the scanning experts, the more technical aspects of of training perception. So we'll have the pros and cons of working within the, the football nought, what that is bringing players in terms of uh, adapting their skills, and um, what it's missing in terms of training those perception skills and that transference onto the grass. And sort of asking maybe the, the million dollar question as scanning is, I mean, we're seeing all the top players doing it. Are they just special or is it a trainable skill? Can we train players across all levels to have this ability to scan and take in what's going in around them? Um, so, so we can get onto that. Let me introduce you to today's guests, and I will uh, start with Kevin McGreskin, former technical director of the Cook Islands. Uh, Kevin, how are you today? I'm good, thanks, Steve. Uh, great, great to chat with you, and uh, thanks for inviting me on. And um, I'm looking forward to this chat with you and, and Adam and uh, the questions from from the attendees. So great. Um, yeah, just wanted yeah right now whether you could um, yeah just share with us a little bit of your your footballing pathway, your journey to to where you are now. Um, well, I mean, I've been coaching for for as long as I remember. Um, playing wise, never really made it. I always say that I. Uh, you know, I had to retire early from playing because of a really bad um, first touch. <laughs> that was that was what let me down. Um, but I got into coaching. I was very lucky to have. Uh, I keep talking about. I was talking about um, today. Uh, a, a mentor, Bobby Jenks, who was at Hearts, and he encouraged me to get into the the uh, coaching side of things. Uh, uh, Twenty five years ago, and I've, I've been doing it since then. And uh, it's been great. I've, I've uh, managed to work at a lot, well, a lot of different national associations. Uh, now I do presentations uh, on uh, vision awareness, cognitive performance. Uh, I've done that on the UF Pro License, A License, B License courses, etc. I've worked with the Welsh FA, the Irish FA, quite a lot over the past 11, 12 years. I've uh, also done some work with the Croatian FA. And I've also been lucky enough to uh, be involved coaching at the, um, at the professional level in Scotland. Um, Jackie McNamara, when he got the Partick Thistle job, invited me into Partick Thistle. And we worked there and we implemented some of my ideas on the, the vision and awareness side of things and then did so when he moved to Dundee United. And then I was uh, lucky enough to get offered a technical director job in the Bahamas. <laughs> And it uh, seemed like too good an opportunity to turn down. And since then, I've worked in Canada, been to South Africa, Trinidad, other countries around the world. And as you mentioned, most recently in the Cook Islands, in the South Pacific, which was uh, an incredible adventure, um, a beautiful part of the world. So it was really good. Okay, fantastic. So, yeah, you sort of, yeah, taking your football skills and uh, seeing the world. Yes. Yes, very much so. Very much so. It's uh, been kind to me and uh, made a lot of good friends around the world that, you know, still keep in touch with nowadays, uh, which sometimes is a bit strange when my phone uh, beeps where messages and uh, it's like three o'clock in the morning here, but it's in the afternoon somewhere else in the world. <laughs> so it's been great. Okay, brilliant. Brilliant stuff. Um, so we bring in our second guest today, Adam Bevan, who's a scientific researcher at the 
Hoffenheim Research Lab. Um, as we may have heard prior to coming on live, uh, Adam, I know you're in very good mood today after Hoffenheim's win over, over Bayern Munich today. Yeah, 30, I think we stopped them in their tracks after 32 wins and four cups is the latest I read. Uh, we actually have a pretty good streak over Bayern, which I was pretty, pretty happy about. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty thrilled. And I mean, the game just finished an hour ago or so. So I'm taking that passion and energy for football uh, into this conference. Uh, should I introduce myself or? Yes, yes. Other than being obviously clearly a huge fan of Hoffenheim, tell us a little bit more about your, your background into football and, and as, as a researcher. Yeah, so uh, actually, unlike Kevin, I never even played soccer back in the day. I was born in Canada, so I was a huge ice hockey and um, baseball kind of North American kid. And then when I was 14, I moved over to Australia, which is a lot warmer climate. And yeah, that's where I did my bachelor's of sports science. And that's where I got my first taste of research, which was um, yeah, based at the University of Newcastle. And after that, I yeah, kind of got the, the taste for research. And then uh, I moved over to Germany, where they were the current uh, holders of the World Cup back in 2017. So I thought I was really going to up the football game and players that I worked with. And I spent three years working uh, or at least collecting data at the TSG Hoffenheim. And then after my PhD, uh, yeah, we built quite a good relationship with the staff at, the, at Hoffenheim and they offered me a full-time job to continue to conduct science and football and kind of other areas as well, such as clinical work. Um, yeah, and so I've been doing that for the last six months. And today I will be presenting one of the research papers that we actually conducted uh, at Hoffenheim based on the visual exploratory actions of football players in the football now. Okay, brilliant. Well, we should be looking forward to that in the, uh, the next few minutes. Um, I think at the coin toss though, Kevin, Kevin won and, and elected to go first. So I'll hand over the screen to, to Kevin who will sort of, yeah, give a overview on his his view on coaching game awareness scanning perception right. okay i'll uh, <clears throat> i'll see if i can uh, share my screen here with with uh with my presentation um i've just um uh you can see that okay Yes, perfect. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, obviously, um, tech approach to training perception. Uh, uh, this uh, little bit of the presentation is by myself. Um, I, I did uh, um and ah about actually putting in brackets a low tech approach to uh, training perception. Mm -hmm. That's very much where I've been. Um, you can maybe see from the screen here on the top left, uh, that was me when I was at Partick Thistle and Dundee United there. Um, and we used to incorporate things like gloves and tennis balls, et cetera, et cetera, into our sessions to, to get the players uh, more actively engaged in active scanning. Um, uh, good fun as well, but obviously a, a, a meaningful thing behind it. Uh, the other picture, I've got, I was presenting with the Croatian FA on their uh, pro license and, and A license courses. And as I mentioned, uh, I do a lot of work with the Irish FA. So I presented for the past 12 years with, with them on their their UEFA courses um, and did practical sessions as well as theory so it's, it's been good. Um, so where I thought I would start here and, and I appreciate we're going to discuss the tech thing so I just uh, as we mentioned uh, we go from the practical coaching perspective of what we need to consider and the first thing here is really just about um, the decision making process uh, that, that players go through. So, what you would think a decision making model might be. There's some great work out there by Gary Klein in uh, recognition prime decision making. Uh, there's other authors that do it. In fact, there's a, um, the OODA Loop, there's a great presentation by a coach called Larry Paul. He's put it up on YouTube or something. You can go and have a look at that. But fundamentally, um, there's, there's three main components. C, uh, the perception side, the decision side, and the action side, and that's what these symbols are meant to signify. And I, I call it see, think, play, uh, is uh, what, what I call the decision making. And a lot of people would think it just flows linearly. You, you, 
really each thing just feed forward to the next. So if you see something, then you think about it and then you act upon it. Uh, a little bit more complex than that. Um, but something that I've seen that um, hopefully um, uh, we'll be discussing later is part of the problem is a lot of players actually receive the ball first before they even have a look. And so that's that's a challenge. Uh, they don't know the picture, so they can't make a decision in advance. So that would be a kind of standard form of a, a decision model. Uh, obviously not performed optimally, but uh, there's other models out there to, to have a look at. But this gets the discussion started. I use a, a, a more multidimensional model when I talk about decision making because I feel each factor influences the others because what you're capable of performing is going to impact on how you see things, you know, how you perceive things and the affordances uh, for, um, that are there, the opportunities for action that are there. Uh, but I'm not going to, it's not decision making that we're on about today. Really, it's this part here um, where awareness, when we talk about game awareness, what is it? Well, it sits here in the perception part or as I call it, the C part. So uh, that's where it sits within a decision making model. Game awareness, uh, and I'll talk more detail, it is not decision making, it's something separate from decision making and uh, if, if we're going to really try and get a handle on this then it's important that we make that distinction. So when, we t when I talk about game awareness there's actually, you know, there's, there's a little bit of research starting to creep out there but there's actually not much available so uh, the best thing to do is look to see is there other sports or other, other films that look at this kind of thing and fortunately um, Mike Ensley, um, she does some fantastic work. Uh, she was a pioneer in, in modeling situation awareness, as it's called, uh, which has its roots in aviation, but has been shown to apply to whether you're, you're flying a plane, driving a car or playing sports. Uh, and she's been a great help to me. Uh, you know, she's, she's lent a lot of support to me and provided papers and advice as, as I've been exploring this aspect uh, within our game. And the, 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 she has a three-level model, again, of uh, situation awareness. Level one, perception of er elements in the current situation. Level two is comprehension of current situation. Level three, projection of future status. The important thing um, to determine, I feel, is that, as I've got here, level two goes beyond being aware of the elements that are present to include an understanding of the significance of those elements in light of pertinent operator, operator goals. And I think this is important for us to understand. Level two is where people put meaning to something. And often when we talk about, you know, scanning or awareness, straight away people say, well, the players have got to understand. Yes, but when you look at awareness, there are levels to awareness. And we've got to help players be proficient in all aspects of awareness. Uh, level two is where meaning is, but getting access to the information in the first place is as as Gaia mentioned in, in one of your uh, webinars the other week. That's the gateway. The scanning is the gateway to the understanding. Um, so when I talk about game awareness, I, I follow a similar three level model. I just use different words that we can apply to our game. Uh, level one, uh, call observation, and this is uh, a brief definition of that would be active scanning of the playing area and panoramic positioning. And positioning is a really big, important part of the what I use to define awareness in, in our game. It's not really mentioned quite so much in Ensley's research uh, because, again, initially the, hers was based around maybe people looking at, at display panels, etc. But, you know, she's moved on to, to have infantry troops on the ground. So there's great research to have a look at there. But the positioning of players is hugely important at the different levels and what they're looking to do. So here I say it's panoramic position and really that's just getting open to as much of the field of the play as possible. Um, if you're receiving a pass, can you be side on instead of square on? You know, these are the basic fundamentals that a lot of coaches will talk about, but we don't necessarily get um, productive adaptation of behaviours of players when they're, they're, they're performing in the game. Active scanning having a look, uh, visual exploratory activity, uh, however you want to term it. Um, so that, that's level one, nice and simple. And this is just about accessing information. It's not about, about putting any meaning to that information. Uh, so that's the important distinction here. Can we get players to look around? Meaning will come later. 
level two realization that that's that's where the meaning comes that's reading the game and adaptive positioning so reading the game as in making sense of the game making an understanding of the game this is where the players will start recognizing patterns cues etc and recognizing scenarios that, that, that the coaches is maybe played you know patterns of play that specific cues that are asking for the players to look uh, uh, or look to find and, and respond to. And the adaptive positioning here, whereas panoramic positioning was about being open to as much of the field of the play as possible, adaptive positioning is about being at the right um, orientation and location in relation to the ball teammates and opponents around you. Um, so obviously they're dynamic, they're moving, so you need to adapt your positioning to be in the most effective position for that moment, for that game situation. So again, it's really crucial that this positioning aspect is there because a player might be able to understand what's happening in the game, but if they're in the completely wrong position, it's it's no use. So they need to really be a um, an, an active participant in this. And uh, level three, uh, anticipation. Just keep it nice and simple. Predicting how the player is likely to develop and prospective position. So this is about them as play is happening, then identifying where they might need to be um, and maybe having a couple of steps or so in that direction. So if they see that a switch of play is maybe going to happen, the player will identify where they're maybe going to need to, to go to, to defend that. Um, and they'll loosen off their relationships with the players in that area that they are just by a yard or two. So they're, they're being preemptive about getting to the new location. Obviously, they need to still be there in case the play stays in that area. So th these are you know three simple levels, but it's important to understand that observation, it's, it's about scanning the playing area in the first place. Then, you know, as we move on, we can get more directive where the, maybe they should look or the players will understand, know where's the best places to look. But that that will come later. And so that's it. Observation, realisation and anticipation. Uh, quite simple. Uh, but, you know, fundamentally, it works if we, if we think of it that way. If we use situation awareness as... Um, something that we could lean on, use that as our reference, and then look to how do we apply that more specifically to our game. Um, this is what I, you know, a little um, continuum matrix, whatever you want to call it, uh, when I'm, I'm looking at players uh, and how they play. Act uh, so A, B, C, D, E, and F, um, keep it nice, simple letters. A for active scanning, do the players have a look? Does the player scan and, and look around the playing area away from the ball on a consistent basis? Are they doing that often enough? And I think, you know, the research has increasingly shown that players maybe don't do it as often as they should. Uh, body position. Um, does the player optimise the, their orientation and location on the field? Um, check again or confirm. I sometimes use confirm. Check again. Can the player have that one last look even as the ball is on its way to them? Uh, then the decision, D being the decision, can they think quickly, how good's their quality decision? And an important thing, I think the, the decision should be evaluated independently from the execution of the game action. A player could still make a good decision, but just execute the action poorly. Um, so that's an important distinction for us as coaches to try and make. Uh, e, execution, uh, can they make the play then? Can, can they execute the decision so once again how effective is that execution and that should be evaluated independently from the decision so again um they might make a great pass but was it the best pass was it the best decision at that moment in time it might have been functional but was it really effective and then follow on uh that i th think this is quite important and that's next action how quickly does the player re-engage with the game and re-establish awareness and minimize the latency between one game action and the next um and what happens often is players will play a pass and they can switch off briefly and momentarily so can we get them one re-engage with the game where they're probably going to need to scan again maybe quite quickly to to get their bearings again because they've maybe been focused on the ball one team make a couple of opponents, etc. Now, when that passes went, depending on what the subsequent action could be, 
can they get the bigger picture again? So engage in active scanning again, come back around in that loop. And the reason I talk about this is, uh, basically, like, I mean, there's been some research done, one that some was done by Chris Callan. There was a couple of other people that I think used the same data. It was research in League One in France for about the 2005 and six season, and they looked at player activities. Um, um, and what they did and they found that really the, the players on the whole, the average number of possessions of the ball, so the number of times they actually got involved with the ball was 47. 47 times in the entire game. Obviously, an average, some had more, some had less. Uh, the average time per possession was 1.1 seconds, so not a lot of time that you're actually on the ball. We've all said maybe is it about 2% of the time that a player is on the ball? And, and even when they got the ball, the average amount of touches was only two. So players really need to know what they're going to do with the ball beforehand if they're going to be effective. And again, this, this look before they receive the ball as opposed to just after they receive the ball. Um, so that, 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 was, that was it. So roughly 90% um, uh, of the time, yeah, or 85% of the time here, I've got your off the ball actions and the brown areas, the receiving the ball. So I based that time on Geyer uses 10 seconds before receiving the ball. So that's, that's a notional value there. But uh, looking at how many times you actually have the ball in the 10 seconds prior adds up to around about just under eight minutes in a game. Um, you've got your, your minute or so where you're actually physically on the ball. And then the, the yellow signifies after you've played the pass. So that, that period of time for about three seconds, what are you doing after you've released the ball? Uh, have you re-engaged with the game? Have you maybe adaptive position and again got into the right positions in relation to ball teammates and opponents? So the point being here with that is that the shaded area now is the stuff that you pretty much do off the ball you know, on a consistent and continuous basis throughout the game. Um, players have got to be doing that effectively, with the primary one being active scanning, because the active scanning gives you the information in order for you to position yourself in order to be effective to whether receive the ball, support the ball, support teammates, etc. So these actions have to be really... Um, we need to help players make this active scan and, and having those looks as part of the, what they do off the ball, but part of their receiving skills as well. What they do when they're receiving the ball, it's not just about looking at the ball and controlling it. A couple of very quick videos, I think they're about 20 seconds long at the most. Uh, I'll play this uh, and, and we're going to look at the player that's ringed the, the centre midfielder here, just to have a little look. Um, so this was at Dundee United, uh, while well, I was helping with the coach in there. And Will has a look up the field, uh, there he's getting the ball back, has another look up, passes it back to the, def the fullback, has another look up the field. Uh, he looks inside to see what players are there. So a little quick clip of active scanning, obviously, is there stuff there that hey, we could help improve on, etc. Yes, but to show that players do it. And this is the Scottish Premier League. Um, so to show that players do it, do they do it often enough? And the reason I use this clip is because we'll look through it again and we're going to look at the same midfielder and we're going to look at the player that he interchanges passes with because uh, I think this is interesting. Um, so there's the centre midfielder. Now he's got the ball. He's going to engage with this, this left back here. So the left back's just looking at the ball. The left back's just looking at the ball. The centre midfielder looks up the field to play. The full back's still looking at the ball. Set midfield looking up the field to play. Fullback still looking at the ball. Fullback still looking at the ball. Set midfielder looks up the field. Fullback still looking at the ball. And for the first point, he looks up the field to play to see what his options are. And that that's that's not me me here to to say that that player's a bad player. He's not. He's a he's a, he's a very good player, and he's went on to have a, a decent career. Um, but it's as a coach can we identify aspects of performance that we can maybe help them become even better? Okay, what can we help them add to the game? So as we can see there, we often say players do it, and yet and they do it regularly, but we've just looked at a clip there where one player is scanning and the other player isn't. So I think that's uh, an important, uh, you know, I like that clip because it shows that both players doing both things. 
And then the, pretty much the last thing that I'm, I'm, I'm going to touch on here, and again, that, this will maybe help us with the debate with technology as, as well, or the discussion with technology, the observation um, put in here, but it plays a part in level two as well, the key moments for active scanning. There's, you know, there are a number of times in the game, but we'll look at five key moments. So as the ball has been, is traveling between two players. So when the ball is moving between um, two teammates or two opponents, there's an opportunity for a player to scan away from the ball. Okay, so, and again, when we're on about scanning and visual exploratory activity, normally we're on about a look away from the ball. So can they have that look away from the ball? And can we help them develop that? Um, as a teammate or opponent takes a control and touch, so if they aren't popping it off first time, they're taking a control and touch, there's another moment where the ball is going to be a little bit dead and the player can have a little look away um, to, to see what's going on and how the picture has changed around them, because obviously it's quite a dynamic game. Uh, in between touches, when a teammate or opponent is running with the ball, so if a teammate or opponent is running with the ball and it, once they're taking that touch at their feet and they're going after it again, again, there's not much going to happen with the ball in that moment in time. Can the player then look away from the ball to, to look at other players, whether it's opponents, so they can see where am I going to run? Am I going to drift off behind them? Am I going to um, make that run across them and in front of them? Where is that de defender up against me looking? Uh, once they look at the ball, is that a good moment for me to time my run now. So can you have a look away from the ball there? And the last couple, uh, first one, as the ball is traveling when receiving a pass. So can you do it as late as possible, but as early as needed? Um, sorry, and so how, how late can you leave that last look, but do it as early as needed, depending on the pressure, depending on the situation, etc. Because obviously the game situation will change, and can you have the latest information available for you to act upon? So again, how can we encourage players to do that? And the last one, as the ball is traveling after you pass the ball. So once you pass the ball, depending on how you're then going to interact maybe with the player that you've passed it, um, but can you have a look then? Can you scan then? So as early as possible now, but as late as needed. So the sooner you can get your eyes back up to the field of play to see where the ball teammates' opponents are or teammates' opponents in spaces, etc., the more quickly you can be effectively engaged in the game again. So as the ball's travelling, once you have passed the ball, but as early as possible and as late as needed. And really, from a, from a, a game awareness and scanning perspective, I, th I think you know, I've touched on the main points that as, as a coach that we should be looking to develop in our players. Um, as I mentioned, we, I, th I think it's something that we really need to look at helping players develop as part of their receiving skills. Uh, so when they receive a ball, it becomes their default behavior to, to have a scan in the, um, the preparation phase and then in the receiving phase as late as possible as well. So, and that's it. That's, uh, that's, that's me um, done. And, and uh, that's all I really wanted to, to talk about to get us into the discussion. Right, brilliant. Thanks a lot for that, Kevin. That was um, fantastic. I think that kind of sets a, a firm foundation for uh, Adam to step upon um, and take us inside the football note and the research he's done, well, specifically this one piece of research you've recently done um, at Hoffenheim. Adam, I, uh, I'll pass the screen over to you. All right. Well, Kevin, I mean, you're a veteran presenter. I think uh, everybody just witnessed that. So it's going to be tough to follow up after such a clear way to coach someone through your presentation. Yeah, so, I mean, I enjoyed it a lot. So I'm looking forward to trying to, to not limbo under the bar that you just set so easily, but I'll do my best. All right, so... See if I can share my screen. All right. Are we up and rolling on your end? Yep, I can see it. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank 
uh, Steve for having me on the on the show. Um, I'm happy to be able to present again on the virtual stage uh, with Steve. I presented, I think, last week or just a few days ago, so it's good to be back already. Uh, thanks again for the Sports Innovation Group for for hosting it and all the all the things that they've done behind the scenes. So thanks for creating a platform for Kevin and I to discuss uh, our opinion on the matter. Uh, lastly, Kevin. Thanks again for your presentation. And to the audience, please try to get involved as much as you can. And I didn't see the chat box light up so much, but you know, now's your time during my presentation to really filter in your questions. So Kevin and I have some material to discuss uh, with you guys and answer some of your questions. So today I'm gonna to be talking about more about the insights from the T TSG Research Lab, the key word being research in that, um, Kevin, you mentioned quite a large practitioner side of this, and I'm going to be talking about more objective measurements uh, in a, the, a scientific manner. All right, let's see if this wants, there we go. So this is quite a famous quote that uh, my good friend Thomas, who is a big researcher in uh, head movements has used many of his presentations. And so I stole it, sorry, Thomas, but, yeah, basically this is a, a good example of one of the best players in the world that basically is clearly quoting how much he emphasizes that he scans the field. And one thing that I like about this is that he's not just saying that he looks uh, in any direction without purpose, that he actually tries to explain why he's looking all the time. And I do like the emphasis yeah, that he says that he's rotating it more than 500 times. Uh, it's kind of arbitrary because I'm sure he's not counting during the match. But what we're going to do later is actually discuss how much players are uh, turning their heads in the game. So I'm sure everybody has seen this, uh, this presentation slide from Gear. And I, I imagine that's why people are here and tuned in today because they have probably seen one of Gear's uh, presentations across the last few years and it's really, he's really been one of the, the main leaders in terms of head movements. So previous research has demonstrated that perceptual motor abilities of the players are strongly linked um, with their performance of their technical abilities in the sport. And these visual exploratory actions that occur in the moments leading up to receiving the ball has consistently demonstrated a strong positive relationship with the success of passing uh, once receiving the ball. Now, as Kevin mentioned, this is normally studied by Guerre and his team roughly 10 seconds leading up to uh, when they receive the ball. And what they're looking for is a visual exploratory action is defined as the turning of the head on the longitudinal axis uh, for athletes to gain information about their surrounding environment. Um, and these exploratory actions basically help these athletes to try to get a better understanding or awareness of both the positions of their teammates and the opponents. They're also searching for some free space to move and to try to understand where their position on the field is relative to other players. So when we look at some of the statistics here on the field, we see that there's an exploratory frequency of 0 0.62 ex explorations a second. And what this basically means that on the field, Frank Lampard was roughly looking um, about 6.2 exploratory actions in the leading 10 seconds um, before receiving the ball. Okay, so just to put that into perspective, um, yeah, they're basically Frank Lampard and Steven Gerrard were some of the, the athletes that were also demonstrating uh, most, I think they were like the leaders of how much they actually were exploring in the field. And I'm sure that everyone has seen Frank Lampard's uh, video of him turning his head multiple, multiple times. And that's really, yeah, what catches our attention as well as researchers. So I'll try to show you a quick video from uh, Arsenal about if players do not make uh, the exploratory actions. And it's always good to use David Luiz as an example. So let's hope that this video works for everybody. So as you can see, he does not make any head movement. Oh, they're behind again. So simply Look again. lost their focus in the joy of equalizing. So, Basically, if he just did make a few exploratory actions, he would have seen that 
and the player was coming behind his back. And this is kind of what we're trying to avoid. So we talk a lot about the positives of being able to uh, explore your environment. And the reason is, is because if you don't do these exploratory actions, then of course football is a dynamic environment where things change uh, in this 360 degree uh, perception. So you really have to be aware uh, of every single aspect of, you know, front, left, right, behind, and you basically have to be scanning religiously throughout the game. And so what we wanted to do as scientists uh, was to actually put an objective measurement on this. There, so there has been a lot of filming of people uh, on the field, but that doesn't necessarily give us a really strong objective measurements that we can actually get in a laboratory-based field. Um, and we know at Hoffenheim that the more experienced and the older athletes are performing the, be uh, the best in the football now, but we wanted to quantify their perceptual motor abilities um, that maybe helps explain as to why they are actually performing better in the football now. So do they have better perceptual uh, abilities to pick up the cues that, that we deliver in the football now? And we wanted to use these initial measurement sensors uh, or the, the units in order, to, in order to measure that. So what we did was we brought a team uh, from Australia, from the Australian Catholic University, and they came up with a really ingenious way to measure head movements was basically to putting these accelerometers into a tennis headband. And then that basically was at the back of the head. And every time you moved that this would be registered at 500 Hertz. Uh, and that way we can get quite an accurate sample um, of exactly how fast they are moving their head um, and how many times they are moving their head and when. Um, yeah, so we measured, I guess, three main visual, visual exploratory actions. So the first one is the head turn count, um, which is the total number of head movements conducted within a specific time frame. Um, and that was exactly what we showed you with the Frank Lampard, uh, the 0 0.62 exploratory actions. The second one is the head turn frequency, and this is the amount of head turn movements per second. Uh, and these two attributes basically together uh, give us how often a player is changing their visual exploratory uh, orientation. And the third measure is the head turn excursion, which is basically the total size of degrees of head movements per second. So are they only looking 30 degrees? Are they looking, you know, 90 degrees? Are they looking 180 degrees? Uh, yeah, and so basically this basically puts a degree number on their head movement. And this shows how much of the environment that they are exploring. So together we have how often coupled with how much of the environment they are exploring. And what we did was we had two groups, the under 13s and the under 23s, uh, from, from Hoffenheim be put into the football now. So they had 32 balls on a standardized session, which I will show you a video in a second. And basically we had two aims. First, we wanted to just observe uh, the head movements in the football now. And we also wanted to know whether there was position or group differences in terms of their perceptual, um, yeah, their perceptual abilities, which would help explain their performance in the football now. So this is a freeze frame of what the football now looks like from a GoPro camera, Please, the 70 gates, uh, two rows, top and bottom, eight ball dispensers, and basically the pattern as to where the ball can come out and where the player has to kick the ball into uh, is random for them. But for us as scientists, it is a standardized 32 pattern. So they don't know where they're going uh, to have to pass the ball into. Um, and so it really does for a 360 degree environment. And so we'll just quickly show you, this guy's quite comfortable in the football now. And you can see the headband uh, on his head here. And we divided our analysis into two phases. The first one is the exploratory actions that they made before receiving the ball. And the second phase is um, the exploration, explorations that they made after they have received ball possession. Now, what we can see in these graphs is that um, there are two main observations. So in green are all the players in the under 13s and in blue are the, the 23s. And the first thing is, is that 
the under 23s can or demonstrate that they scan the environment more before receiving the ball, uh, whereas at the under 20, under 13s explore a little bit less. So you can see that on the orange, uh, the orange color graph. Um, and we see that there's a strong association between head movements and uh, the response time that they had in the Fukuna. And this also aligns with the previous research that shows that athletes who have greater than three head or head visual exploratory actions before receiving the ball were 0 0.5 seconds faster in their passing actions uh, than those that only explored from zero to one times before receiving the ball. Uh, and I think that this also ties nicely into Kevin's video showing how some players that they look a lot and some other players they don't look so much okay so there really is this nice inter individual differences that we picked up and, and displayed in this study and um, the good thing is is that unlike the field that Kevin was demonstrating um, that's very subjective and, and it also is difficult to kind of say that that same, that same player in that position should have looked more because the other player in another position was looking more okay so it's kind of you know, into individual on the field, and that's difficult to kind of compare them, although they're both defensive players. Whereas in the football now, every player gets the exact same pattern of the 32 balls. Uh, and so we can really standardize these head movements across the players. And I think that's a little bit more difficult to do on the pitch. So these are the head movements that players displayed before receiving the ball. And the next graph shows what players' visual exploratory actions were after uh, they received the ball. So what we can see is that the older group scanned the environment less after receiving the ball. And that was up to 50% decrease in head movements uh, from them. So they actually explored a lot more before receiving the ball and a lot less before receiving the ball. Whereas we can see that the under 23s actually have more head movements after receiving the ball. So the main summary of this is that older players explored the environment more before gaining possession of the ball and less after gaining possession of the ball, whereas it was opposite for the under 13s, where we see that the younger group explored less, receiving, uh, less before receiving the ball and more after they gained possession. We also broke it down into different scanning behaviors between various playing positions. Uh, and what we can see here on the graphs is that uh, there does seem to be some differences between the under 13s and uh, the under 23s, whereas the defenders and forwards for the younger age groups have less exploration of the environment before receiving the ball compared to the older defenders and forwards. Um, and what we can also see here is that after receiving the ball, the younger midfielders and goalkeepers were exploring more after receiving the ball than the older group. So, yeah, what, what we basically can say here is that there does seem to be something from when they're young to they're old and more experienced. And this process of growing older in the game really does seem to refine uh, the timing of the head movements, and also you, know, you can see these playing position differences. Uh, and so what we wanted to do in the future is to measure more age groups, because um, we only measure two at the moment, and really try to see at what age group does these uh, head movements start balancing out with the professional players. Uh, and I'm going to finish off here in the takeaway points is that Overall, a uh, higher head turn count before a player received the ball was associated with a reduced time uh, to complete the trials in the football now, whereas a higher head turn count after a player received the ball was associated with a, time to, a, a longer time that they needed to complete the trial. And I wanted to show these graphs because head movements are not necessarily linear meaning that just because we say that head movements before receiving the ball can improve your response time, it doesn't automatically mean that you should look 10 times before receiving the ball. You know, there does seem to be a balance in order to make you faster, okay? So sometimes more is better, but too much can also be harmful. So 
that's the end of my presentation here and I'll get back onto the slides once we start talking about how we're actually going to be uh, training this at Hoffenheim after we had the results of this study. So if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to discuss them with Kevin. Hi there. Um, so, sorry, Steve, I can't hear you if you've got your... Always forget to unmute myself. <laughs> um, yes, it seems to be uh, quite a few questions filtering in, but I'm going to sort of jump in myself um, and sort of just ask some specific, specific details on, on the research you've done, Adam. Um, um, first point, um, when you had the testing each of the players, um, they all just had one run, 32 balls, everyone at the same speed, or did you do it at two different levels of speed for each player? No, so we used a standardized, uh, a standardized format for the football now. So it was 50 kilometers ball speed, and we actually only used the bottom row of the football now uh, in order to make it technically achievable for the under 13s so there wasn't an unfair advantage mm -hmm. and we also used standardized 32 balls and they also had two sessions of 32 balls before putting the headset on for our normal testing so this is something that we do every single season twice a season and we basically just tagged on an extra session so the under 13s are very competent already at this. Um, yeah, so there wasn't necessarily, that's not the aim, I guess, that we were going for, is more just to kind of see which perceptual differences that they had in the football now. Uh, yeah, I was just asking mainly just to see whether there would be a difference if at the quicker speeds it forces players to look more than possibly if the ball is coming at a less sort of more active more if it's coming at a slower speed but if there's more time between each ball coming to them that all right they feel a bit more comfortable they're not they're not looking as much whether mm -hmm. there was any correlation in terms of the amount of time that they had the speed of the speed of play but yeah i'm not so i'm not sure what the math is but it's roughly 50 kilometers an hour and i think standing in the middle of the football out would uh, it's only seven meters or eight meters from the ball dispenser. So it does come at them quite quick. Um, yeah, which is just to, to force how good the experts are or the more experienced players are because they still get those head movements in even though that the ball is coming at them at a very rapid pace that they are still able uh, to see where the target is. And then once they have the, the ball, they got two contacts uh, and then they're able to, to complete the pass. So, yeah, I guess it just speaks more towards their expertise um, that they're, they're able to still scan whilst the ball is oncoming. Hmm. The speed you've chosen then would be more of a comfort level for the under 13s, which then if it's a comfort level for them, I'm assuming it's super comf comfortable for under 23s, or did you, or was there some kind of balancing out that it was? All right, we speeded it up a little bit more so that, you know, it was also a similar test for under 23s. It would be more relative to the speed that they would, they would feel within a game at that level. Yeah, I mean, so to be honest, the reason why we stuck with 50 is because this is just a standardized test that we give all the players from the under 12s to the professional team. Um, yes, it's more difficult for the under 13s, but we know from other research that we've already published that they are able to handle the speed. It will be easier for the under 23s, but nonetheless, 50 kilometer ball does come at you quickly. Uh, and so we didn't really want to play around with the speed, although we can make it anywhere from zero to 100 kilometers an hour. We just thought for the sake of doing research, we just stuck with what the standardized, um, yeah, the standardized speed of the Fopana from the previous research that we published in the Fopana. But yeah, it's a good point. I think for training, for sure, you could, you should play around with the speed for sure. And on, on the research side, I don't know, Kevin, whether you wanted to jump in there and some of the sort of behaviors that that, that showed. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's interesting, you know, first of all, yeah, great, great presentation, Adam, love it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of technology and and that, is, as I've, I've mentioned to a lot of PR, I think uh, it's a great way to, to supplement the players' training and if you've got the money to, to invest in these things, fantastic. Unfortunately, uh, Patrick Thistle didn't quite have the money to invest in a football knot. Um, so we stuck with the gloves and tennis balls, but they, they were quite effective. But yeah, I mean, I, th I think uh, you, you mentioned about the, um, you know, being an optimum amount of times to, to look uh, mm -hmm. in there before receiving the ball. Um, you know, is, is that, Obviously, there's a you know there's quite a strict time constraint there for the player. Um, mm -hmm. You know when they receive their cue and when the ball is going to be passed to them, etc. That they they've got a limited time to to look anyway. Where um, you know where, whereas Gaia's looked at, at the live games and you know looked at the ten seconds in the build up uh, before receiving a pass. Whereas uh, I would uh, so I'm asking. Um, that I would imagine that this is really being sampled within a fraction of, of that 10 seconds. Um, you know, it's, it's right at the end of that 10 seconds, the last, you know, what was the time component between them having the cue that to, for action and, and when the ball was, was played to them, et cetera? What, what was the kind of time in there that the player, operating time had play, the player had in there before they were able to the first touch? I mean, I, I mean, whatever, whatever 50 kilometers an hour is, Divided by eight meters, or, or, <laughs> or the other way around. I'm not. I'm not a math person. I mean, I I consult with st st statisticians for this reason. I mean, I I would probably say it's under a second uh, for them uh -huh. from the cue to them actually receiving the ball is probably about yeah. Let's just say about a second, just so math is easy. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I would say that of course Gears research is the top or the, the last 10 seconds, but with the football now, there's, I mean, just from the design of it, there's no way that we, can, we can notify them within 10 seconds and then give them multiple cues. It's very much the, the very last part of uh, play leading up to when they receive the ball. So I think that's something, unfortunately, we can't do in the football now. So mm -hmm. we can only make it as realistic up to the last second, I would, I would yeah. say. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a quick calculation there, and I'm, I'm sure, I, you know, based on that eight meters and fifty kilometers, it's probably, uh, you know, uh, I've made it maybe a bit they've got just over half a second or something to respond. Yeah. So it's it, or half a second operating time in order to scan. Um, mm -hmm. So again, and that that's not, you know, I, I'm not devaluing the football or, or in any way. I think I think it's great, um, but it's as you know behaviors in the game you, you would hope that players are going to you know back, back to what i was talking about that the game awareness side of things where that they're going to scan early in order to orientate themselves in relation to ball teammates and opponents which then helps them position themselves to move the ball on quickly from where they're hoping to get it from to where they're hoping to put it to you know so that the football not doesn't really necessarily replicate that as such I've, I've, you know, mm -hmm. suggest from the way it operates, my knowledge of the way it operates. But obviously, players will also encounter those situations in the game where, where maybe for whatever reason they haven't had a look before and haven't been looking in the build up to the play, and all of a short, sudden they're receiving a short, quick pass. Can they get a little scan in? Um, you know, so yeah, yeah it, it's still, to, to me, there's, there's still, you know, it's a great tool and it's a great training tool and it'll help players and helps them with the first touch, helps them in maybe ingrain that as part of their receiving skills. Um, but what I find is is lacking is the the scanning, the preparation, the pre-scanning that happens even before that, the, the right. active scanning engagement even prior to that moment in time, which is, I think, the, the area that, that, that players do lack in when... when or, say lacking and probably better to say could help to add to their game you know yeah and, uh, so for sure that the, the the head movements that are being made 10 seconds leading up to the ball are just as important if not more in terms of their pre-orientation yeah uh, 
to the last second because I think the last second is more of a confirmation of what they've already made in their head yes. based on if hopefully the environment hasn't changed too much in that, yes. in that moment. Uh, but I think if I go back to your level one and level two, you know, it's, it's a lot about making the actual movement or, or training the behavior to mm -hmm. scan in these short moments um, that I think the Fopana can definitely work on. In terms of level three, when you talk about prospective positioning and anticipation, that I would say, yes, definitely that's where the Fopana cannot give you because you cannot prospectively position yourself necessarily too much um, in terms of on the field, because the football night, you kind of have to stay in the middle in order to receive yeah. the ball. But I think in terms of, you know, the actual scanning behavior of the athlete and in terms of accessing information in the last second and making that decision is definitely a trained behavior that can be used with repetitive block practice, for instance, in the football night. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that it's definitely, it has its place mm -hmm. and it, it obviously cannot do all three levels. Um, and trust me, it's, it's only more of an addition at the Fopanat and, you know, no soccer player has ever made it to the top with only ever playing in the Fopanat. So yeah. there is, of course, <laughs> a lot of that on field stuff that they're achieving level three in. But yeah. I think level one and level two, and probably more level one in terms of the actual movement of the head, it's yes. probably very nicely enforced into the football now. And, yep. and that's really about, you know, having that 360 degree environment and that, that they, they are working with. But yeah, for sure, I agree with you um, that there are limitations to the football now. And that's why we are trying to really push the development of technology, um, you know, further here at, at Hoffenheim's. Yeah, and, and I think uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we you know we're, we're might be coming for things in slightly different direction, but I, th I think we've actually got fairly common agreement uh, uh, here. And you know, I, I would say that if that's the only time the player looks, then then it's too late. But if they can have, like I mentioned in in, in mine when I was saying, you know, how how late can you look uh, and and ingrain that as part of your receiving skills. Then certainly that there's, I believe there's benefits uh, with with the football, uh, and this comes back to that that level one not being necessarily about any meaning because you know the colours are lights and people get distracted by colours etc. That's not what it's about. It's about helping them ingrain this habit, habit and feeling comfortable even looking away from from where they're going to receive the ball from to try and identify where they're going to move on to. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of that receiving skill then you can move on to like uh, as, as I mentioned with the level two that's where meaning comes in you know with, with Ensley's, uh, Ensley's model that's that's where as you're looking about you're putting patterns to things and identifying cues um, this in the football not that last conf last confirmation look to yep that's where I want to go um, after everything else that's come beforehand so no that, that, that was really interesting I think um uh, the, a couple of things I, I wanted to, to ask as well was, uh, um, and, and Steve's kind of touched on things about, you know, the, the speed of the ball, technical proficiency, and, and you, you dealt with them. Um, the the under-23s, you said, uh, looked more before and less after than the, the U13s. They looked less before and more after than, you know, obviously I was, my... my reading it into that is well, the reason they had to look more afterwards is because they didn't identify their target zone before mm -hmm. they got the ball so mm -hmm. and again in the game that that go, links to that first kind of decision linear decision model where the player receives the ball then they have the look then they play the pass and in the in the context of the game that's all too slow too late and allows the opposition to defend effectively etc so mm -hmm. no I found that I found that good. I, I suppose a there wasn't really a question there because you've discussed and answered the questions as, as you went along, but uh, thoughts that I had when I, I was looking at it. So I, I thought that was great. Thank you. Well, I guess um, the key thing that I mean, you've just touched on it there as well, Kevin, is that, that difference between the, 
U13s and under 23s. Um, I guess the key point that we want to look at is how do we go from those players who are looking after they receive the ball and are not identifying that target mm -hmm. before they receive the ball and to that sort of situation with the under 23s where, where they are taking that look, as you say, as late as possible mm -hmm. and identifying that target. I mean, sort of ask Adam first. I mean, I don't know how in touch you are with with the coaches through all the age phases there at Hoffenheim and how how that is being developed. Are they specifically developing that through training or has that just been a natural evolution of the players just through playing experience that sort of gained that skill that way? Yeah, so, I mean, I haven't sat down with every coach from all eight uh eight levels of age that we, or nine levels of age that we have and said, you know, head movements are important. Tell me all the, all the training things that you've done. I think that there's already a general understanding that if players are not necessarily aware of their environment, they're not going to be necessarily good football players. And maybe the coach hasn't necessarily identified that that might be the reason that they are slow to, to play or that they are losing the ball a lot and that the opponents are always stealing the ball. But I mean, I think you don't necessarily need head movement sensors to tell you whether a player is scanning or not, because if they're scanning a lot, then they're going to be making better decisions. They're going to not have the ball taken uh, off them from, you know, defenders that have surprised them from behind, for instance, more. They're going to be making better plays, you know, and, and I think that uh, it's not necessarily something that, that I would go to every coach and say head movements are important. Uh, let's train them more. I think that every coach knows that head movements and scanning are important. I mean, it's probably more recent in, in terms of science just confirming this rather than r practitioners, you know, listening to the scientists and being like, oh, actually head movements are important. I think that practitioners and, and people like Kevin have been probably pushing this, you know, implicitly for, for many years before a scientist came over and just confirmed what practitioners already know. Um, would I say that there's a natural progression in terms of training intensity of head movements? I mean, I don't necessarily want to speak on behalf of the coaches and, and whether they do put more of an emphasis or not. To tell you the truth, I'm not on the training pitch uh, to watch these guys, but I, I, I would say that no, it, I mean, I don't think so, because I think that this is just a natural progression of expertise as well. So the more that players are engaging in their environment, the better that they are at taking information in from, from 360 degree perception, you know, and, and maybe the younger age groups are struggling with that. And we do see that they're not able so much to, to look, uh, you know, in terms of the under 23s. But I think that as you get older, you also get a lot better at playing football. And I think that this is maybe a natural skill. Um, to tell you, I don't know, Kevin, maybe you have more of a, have a, a say as to whether practitioners are truly saying that, okay, now you're under 17s, you have to really practice head movements more. Uh, I'm not sure um, if it really goes like that. No. <laughs> yeah. um, well, can, I, can I just reframe that question? Because it kind of fits in with, One's coming in from Kareem Ibrahim. Um, there's two questions, which I hope, Kareem, you don't mind. I'm going to kind of merge them into two, which fits in with what Adam was uh, sort of, yeah, bringing in Kevin in there. So we've had the under 13s to under 23s, and the suggestion is there that at Hoffenheim, there's no problem if at under 13s, it's not quite there, that scanning, that by the time they reach under 13s, it's going to be at a at a decent level. So I guess the question which brings in with Kareem's level is, you know, is there an optimum age you believe that you should be starting this or you can kind of leave it until sort of under 14, under 15, where you maybe are more pointedly sort of introducing players to sort of either things like the football or that is going to force them to use this or in training drills on the grass. So, Kevin, I'll reply first, and, and uh, no if you follow up. And so we actually had Gia Yodet and his team come uh, to visit us at Hoffenheim and, and while we were designing the study. 
Uh, and we also asked him the same question. Of course, we would like to know, you know, is it, what's the optimal age to train this? And as poetic as his reply, and I'm sure he's answered it a thousand times, he said, well, what age do you train your kid to look both ways before crossing the road? See, that's uh, exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and that's just... Pierre's very, very easy analogy to say, should there be an age that are we, should we even discuss with age? And I don't know if there's necessarily a meaningful difference uh, of reinforcing head movements within a year of under 12s and under 13s. I think that this is something that they are learning naturally throughout them just playing football. Kevin? Um. Well, you know, and I understand why you're using the word. I'm going to debate this word. Uh, they develop it naturally because um, I don't think enough players do. And I think therefore it gets neglected. And what's actually interesting is there was a, a paper done by Craig Pooling and Dave Eldridge. Uh, there was a couple of other guys on there as well. That their name escapes me. And they, they researched on coaches' thoughts on on training this aspect of visual explore, exploratory activity and that, and they found uh, almost a third of the coaches told, said it was not a priority, uh, which I found quite, I find quite staggering when, when we look at decision making as the difference maker, um, awareness directly contributes to decision making and how effective you're going to be. Um, and I think there's almost this assumption that, that players look and if players do look and players do develop it naturally and players will develop it through uh, what they do at training and games, I would ask why was there such a significant difference between players in the English Premier League that, that when Gail did his research? Uh, because we're on about some of the top players in the world. We're on about the players competing at the very highest level and they are very good players, uh, yet there's a marked difference in their in their ability to do this um, and their behaviour, their, their automatic behaviours in doing this. So, and therefore, consequently, in how successful they are with the ball. I, th I think uh, on the last um, webinar you did, uh, like he was on about the forward passes, and he used the 39% and 77% statistic. You know, so there's a difference in player that that retains possession and creates opportunities for your team almost eight times out of ten, the ones that are scanning uh, with high frequency, to those players that are giving it away, giving the ball away over six times out of ten, with the players that have low frequency. And we're on about English Premier League players, you know, top, top players. Um, so again, as coaches, can we identify things that we can help players improve their game and add to their game and help them be more efficient? Um, so th there really is this assumption that, that players do it and then the way a lot of coaches train it is they say check your shoulder you know have a look and uh, uh, a colleague that, that I've done quite a lot of work with and did presentations at their um, association and worked with their elite youth national players we're talking about it, we're integrating it into the, the system. I've done a presentation for the staff and the players and I'm working with the players and we're watching a session and a chat with this, uh, the, the performance director. And I said, look, look at the players. They're not scanning, they're not looking, they've not got a picture in their head, etc." So he went up to the coach and said, look, um, we've got Kevin here to work with you guys and work with the players because this is important, you know? And the coach said, yeah, but I've told them to have a look. And uh, the performance director, quick as a flash, turned around and said to him, well, if it's that easy, just tell them to score goals. You know, <laughs> you know so uh, um, it can't be that we're just that. We've got to create the environment to help, uh, to, to put the constraints into the session that help them scan regularly, scan repeatedly, scan under pressure um, throughout the session so that becomes their behaviour. And quite rightly, as Gear says, and I, I've said it in my presentations when I'm asked, what age should you start as early as possible? And I've, I've used the, you know, the crossing the road thing. But when do you teach a kid to cross, cross the road safely and have a look both ways? As soon as you're willing to let go of their hand. But even before you've let go of their hand, you're still with them, coaching them through that process. Um, but I think this is where sometimes we get confused um, because we confuse this game awareness with un 
understanding. And as I've said, there's three levels to awareness and understanding is level two. Um, because people are getting told, well, kids can't really understand tactical concepts or that they're selfish with the ball, etc. Therefore, we don't help them scan the field of play. So yeah, I've worked with players as young as seven and quite successfully helped them scan just a little bit more. Um, now, obviously, they're going to develop that as a habit after one or two sessions. No, not after one or two. But if you're consistently providing them with that kind of environment, it will become part of what they do as they move around the field. It will become part of their receiving skills when they're getting the ball. Um, so the younger, the better. Um, I really think that's important. Uh, a lot of coaches will say, where do we find the time to add this in as well? Uh, another thing that I've got to find and add into training, but when I go away and do presentations, I show drills. I show, right, so your basic A passes to B, passes to C, etc. Mm -hmm. I show dynamic exercises where players are moving around with more freedom in an area, but with necessarily without active opposition. And I show opposed practices, and I just layer the constraints in that force the players to scan the playing area. Um, so it's not about coaches finding more time, it's about maximising the time that they've got. So, that, sorry, that, that, that kind of answers a few questions. And uh, sorry, I've added on to what you mentioned, Adam, when, when you were talking previously with the previous question and, and hopefully addressing that, that question as well, Steve. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, maybe I could add on that because I actually have a few more slides that specifically uh, relate to what Kevin said about the training drills. And it's kind of, uh, again, it's taken from a presentation that I saw Gear present here in Germany. Um, and it basically shows, uh, do you guys see the screen again? Mm -hmm. Yep. It basically shows, yeah, the six, uh, I think six players that went through different, uh, kind of drills and the differences between the scan frequency in game and training activity. So as Kevin, you mentioned, you can, you can show this to the coaches themselves and say, well, I mean, you use these games a lot. I mean, rondos are very popular, but how much are they necessarily, you know, inter, intertwining head movements uh, and, and the drill that, that, that you are giving them? So I think it's not necessarily about them having to ch change their coaching structure or, or try to think of it as more of like, well, how am I going to include this again? You just say, you know, well, it's the same reason why you say, I want a small side of game with this size pitch and this many players and this floater in the middle, because this is how intense that the sports scientist has told me, you know, that it gets the heart rate up, or this is how many touches that they get, uh, you know, in one minute. It's, it's just another performance indicator that would just help them decide whether they would like to choose this as well. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily so far out of overwhelming coaches. I think it's more about just them acknowledging that they can in fact include this in terms of their training. Um, and it's only meant to help reinforce their decisions of which, you know, practice that they, that they have and they, they don't have. And I think that, you know, sports scientists, can really use this and saying, hey, let's choose small sided games. Let's do, you know, uh, 20 by 30, for instance, with six players. And because their heart rate is this high, and also this is how much that they are scanning as well. So it kind of hits from both angles. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, and, and, and I, I agree. And I, th I think, you know, you, you look at those format and this is why when I do the presentations, I show the different types of formats because I'm not saying these are the exercises the player that the coaches need to go out and use. What I'm saying is that whichever format that you're coaching it, there's a way to adapt the, the exercises that you like in a way that helps to promote scanning even more. Um, and because ultimately, you know, you've got coaches that, that have their certain go-to practices and, and that, that's great. And you've got coaches that will still use drills. Uh, not that I tend to use drills that often. I still use them occasionally, but there's lots of coaches that use them. And instead of, when I'm presenting, instead of saying to the coaches, no, don't use drills, I say, okay, if you're going to use a drill, how can we add something in 
that forces the player to engage in the exercise more, to concentrate more, and to to scan more. Um, so it's 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 really about again the, the coaches maximising the time that they have with the players in order to promote this because we're increasingly and I'd, li I'd like to link back to what you said that the coaches increasingly accept that this is important. Yes, they do, but they don't do anything about it. Largely, you know, largely there there is very little getting done to promote visual exploratory activity, simply to promote having a look about and scanning while you're moving about the field of play, scanning in preparation when you're receiving the ball, scanning, having that final look like it would be in the football not as late as possible and having a good confirmatory look of where you want to go with the ball. Lots get said, things like check your shoulder, have a look, etc. Bird on a wire, I've heard all these phrases, but what does that really mean if we don't put the the environment there. In fact, you know, I was, I went, I was, I was doing a bit of work for a championship club um, the other year, and I went along and, and at their training session, and we're on about. I'm talking to their manager, the the head coach, about scanning, and he was saying that he felt it was really important, um, and that it was something that the players needed to develop. But, and we're on about the first team squad, and um, we're watching the training session that they're doing. It's a standard training session that lots of clubs use because it's a good training session and it's effective for some aspects. And um, we're watching it and we're commenting how players are not opening their body up, how they're not looking at the field to play, etc. And I said, well, just add this constraint in because it changes their behavior almost straight away and forces them to look. And he said, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I could do that. Right, okay, great. But then they never did. They never adapted the exercise to force the players to do it. So they, they, they do, I find coaches do say that it's it is something that's important, but then they don't put something in place to to address it. And again, I, I'd like to clarify. I'm not saying the way I do it is the way; it's a way. And other coaches may find their own way. But if we all agree this is important, we have to do something about it out on the training field with the players. If we're here looking pretty much at what you outlined as as level one. For mm -hmm. you, Kevin, we're, we're looking at behaviour of purely just scanning, just that yes. ability of clearing the heads before receiving the ball. And if we're not looking here at the whole decision making process, just that initial turning of the head and you know, not necessarily even sort of worrying about what information they're taking in there. And um, here we're sort of like looking at changing behaviours. So, sort of get more to the point of one of Kareem's questions is sort of yeah, how long does that time scale change? It says obviously as coaches you've got to be patient. It's not mm -hmm. one of those things you're going to train and you're going to get instant feedback that whatever it is you're doing is working. You're going to be this could be over weeks, months. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it's a process, you know. And and how long will this take? Well, how long are you going to devote to it? <laughs> you know, um, uh, for me, it's something that you should incorporate in every in every day you know there should be an aspect of this within your session um what we did very well uh at Thistle, so you know so as i say jackie we, we was about very open-minded about including things like this uh, and we worked with the players and if every day we did this and we we got it to effectively become part of an extended warm-up you know and it was it was uh, something that he believed would would add value, and and it seemed to work. Uh, so, how often, how long are you going to devote to it? How often are you going to do it? Um, you know, I remember one of the courses that I presented on. I think it was a pro license. Uh, sorry, it was an A license, and uh, a coach came up to me and said, "Oh, that he found it interesting, and that he had a session that he works on with his players for vision and awareness uh, to promote scanning." And uh, I said, all right. So obviously that piqued my interest. I said, oh, what's the session? So he's drawn it down. We've had a look at it. Uh, and I was like, okay, so and how often do you do this? Uh, and he said, oh, at least once a season. You know, so, <laughs> you know, how much behavior, behavioral change could you expect if you only do something once a year for what's it going to be? Maybe 20 minutes. Uh, 
I would argue that I wouldn't expect to get very good at anything if I only did it 20 minutes in the space of a year. And I certainly wouldn't expect it to become a behaviour, which is what you're, you're trying to get these things to become, the, the habits that the players carry on to the field, the behaviours that they have that are almost automatic behaviours uh, and they'll carry as they move around the field. So to me, it's how, how often you, go, you how long are you going to devote to it and how often are you going to do it? Um, and like anything, uh, it'll be it'll improve over time. And Adam, the, uh, the football note we kind of seen that it's very much there as a as a support tool uh, as part of the training process. I mean, how often are the players going in there and, and using it? I mean, that <laughs> that ranges from which age group you're talking about and whether they're coming off of injury or not, or, you know, are they healthy? Do they feel like they need the extra training? Uh, yeah, I mean, to tell you the truth, I wouldn't be able to, to give you a specific... You no, know, with, the, with the younger age group, so if we're looking at that under 13 sort of age group, who is sort of very much in the development phases here, then... I think they train in them every Wednesday, from my memory. I know that the female teams are in there at least every morning from 8 to 12 on a Friday, sometimes Thursday nights. And so, you know, they're in there quite often. And uh, we, yeah, we actually had quite a good buy-in from the, the female team as well, the professional team, because they, um, they, we also measured them. We didn't display their results here, but um, we also measured the female team. Yeah, and then the, the, the coach was like, this is amazing. Uh, this is exactly what I've been saying. And this is the, you know, this data is a conversation starter for her to put up on the wall of the change room and being like, you don't scan enough. I've been telling you this, you know, which they do, as Kevin said, and here's evidence. And this is, this is how you uh, scan based on everyone else on the exact same sorry, the exact same pattern of the football now, there's no excuses anymore. Uh, and I think that that's probably, uh, yeah, maybe then they would come to us and say, oh, you know, can we do a little bit more training? So I, I would say on average, maybe once, twice a week, especially in the younger age groups. But, you know, we also got a good buy-in from the older age groups on this as well, especially after we did the study. You know, we had, we actually had a lot of interest in saying, okay, like, well, what should we do differently and how can we change the football now to improve this. And one thing that we did was we removed the second cue to say where the target was going to be. And so they had no idea. So they were having to scan completely unaware as to where they have to pass the target to. And that really starts reinforcing the behavior. So it's actually this nice reciprocal relationship between coaches, practitioners, scientists that we have going at the research lab. So uh, yeah, I think, I think it was nice. I guess the uh, million dollar question is then, uh, even with the way drills Kevin's doing on the, on the grass as well, is the, the transference then from football not onto game, game situations. Um, what is the feeling there? What, what, is, the, what is the strength of, of the football not? What is it giving the players, which they're then coaches maybe anecdotally or what you've been able to sort of measure what is it that's giving to them in terms of their performance on the pitch? In terms of the just regular training? Of the um, not the training, but that training and training that skill. Um, and then what is that transfer? What is the transference onto the, onto the pitch? Might be simply that someone's just really good in the football, not understands the flashing lights and the cues there. Are they then taking that? With those skills transferring, what is what is what is the strength of the football not in terms of transference onto the game situation? Well, I think I wrote this down. Um, there was something that 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 Kevin mentioned is that you know there's a scan before receiving the ball, two touch, pass again, and then uh, you said it really well, Kevin. Kevin, you said re-engage with the game. Uh, the next ball comes as soon as you pass into the gate and they do not have time to switch off. And you can repeatedly uh, give players, uh, yeah, for long periods of time to say, as soon as you make that pass, switch on, keep consistent in terms of 
in terms of playing uh, for the next ball, for instance, and, and trying to help them to not switch off. In terms of how much transfer do they have in the game, it's, it's always the, the million dollar question. I, I don't think that we have. <laughs> There's no way that we could measure the transfer. Uh, I know that when I was at AZ Alkmaar, they, they definitely have video footage of some youth athletes uh, in terms of their head movements. So their, their coaching staff are really huge on head movements. They actually use this to take a player aside, have a conversation with them, show them the video footage. And I'm not sure which training drills they do, but then you know, a few games later, they take video footage again of this athlete and then they compare and then they show how effective their coaching is. So Steve, to answer your question, in order to know uh, whether the foot went out works, we would really need to take a player, measure them in game, who having no experience in the foot went out beforehand, and then seeing whether our interventions had any effect on the, on the field of play. Have we done that? No. Should we do that? Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, I'll definitely write that down and start having a discussion as to some of the things we can play around with. But good point, good point. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a great point, Stephen. It, it actually led into the question that I was going to ask. Uh, and you, you're right, Aaron, it's the, the, the million dollar question. <laughs> um, but yeah, that how do you test the player, um, you know, and what, what's your, then your control group kind of thing? Uh, you know, the, these are the problems, I suppose, when you're trying to research and get empirical evidence, but it's because if you're, you're taking one player and training them, the coach is going to wonder, well, why are not all my players getting the same benefit and uh, and that? But really, it's that, you know, the efficacy of it, the, the transfer from the football not to the game, how, how how does it help them? Um, it, like you said, you can say that about about any anything, really, uh, any um, training device. Um you know, obviously, uh, like I mentioned, I've taken the, the low-tech approach and and where I feel that offers value is that when the players are scanning, they're still scanning for other players, you know, and, and the exercises I use and the layers I add, and they're always looking for other players, which is what they're going to do in the game. Um, some people, you know, technology has its limitation. Well, technologies, if it's just flashing lights, etc. but back to this, well, we're training level one, or you know that, that this gateway is. Uh, you know, I thought that was a great expression, Bagheer, uh, calling it. It's it's the gateway um, to to uh, awareness and, and decision making and and that. So uh, having that ingrained with the player, and learn getting them to do that and become comfortable doing that when they're receiving a ball, you know, and interacting with a ball. I think that's where. Um, you know, uh, I've, I've noticed what, what one of the, the attendees has mentioned about do we maybe over-egg the awareness side of things. I don't think it can be over-egged, but as long as it's done within the structure of what the player might need to do in the game, then then that's important. Um, so you know, as soon as we develop the... the uh, the, the exercise or the, the device that trains everything and answers every question will be millionaires. <laughs> Ah, well, that tees up nicely. I mean, um, have we got the uh, the next device that's going to make uh, make maybe someone at Hoffenheim a millionaire? Then, uh, I believe the, the the Helix. I don't know if you're able to share anything with us on that, Adam, and, and what what you're hoping that can uh, bring to player development. So I can share my screen again, and I'll get into the Helix side of things. Okay. So I'm going to show you guys a video uh, of the Helix in terms of multiple object tracking in a 360 degree environment. And then I'll explain as it goes, but I don't need any sound. All right. So the Helix is the newest invention uh, at the research lab. And basically one of the things that we can project onto this 360 degree environment is object tracking. So they, at the moment, they are just um, robot looking things um, as the, the, base, the basis uh, of our technology design at the moment. And basically these players can run around for eight seconds or, or however long we would like them to 
um, at whatever speed we would like them to, and then they basically come back, and you have to dis you have to choose which two players uh, that at the start you had to track, and which where did they end up afterwards? Okay, and it's basically they run in random directions, whether they start in front of you and run backwards, and they can also go you know further in the distance. Um, and you know they can also we can change the parameters to be in terms of the speed at which they run um, or, or maybe how many objects that they uh, should be able to track we've at the moment stuck with two because um, it's not so sure at the moment in terms of how many player or how many objects can someone track in a 360 degree environment uh, so yeah this is really at the moment in terms of how research is concerned, it's, you know, it's unknown territory. So most of the object tracking is done using VR glasses or, you know, displayed on a 2D wall, whereas this is the first three-dimensional, 360-degree three object tracking device in terms of, uh, you know, on a wall without VR and cables and stuff. Um, and so just as a quick, this is kind of what it looks like with one of our players standing in the middle. Um, and this is, kind of our new toy that we have a PhD, Paul Amen, um, that he's spending his whole PhD from, from this year onwards, uh, trying to develop the Helix in terms of, uh, you know, object tracking and in terms of using this to, to train the athletes. And one part of this is obviously, you know, their head movements in terms of their orientation uh, around them. Um, we can also project realistic images using 360 degree cameras. Uh, and so in terms of fidelity, we have both a gamification approach where we use, you know, non sport specific information, such as the robots that you saw. Um, but we're also looking at a second stream of research in terms of the fidelity of display in terms of you know this presentation and, and training the athletes so we're kind of trying to go on two different streams in terms of the expert performance approach or the cognitive component approach and one's very non-sport specific and one's very sport specific um, and we're trying to see how much that these can overlap to really be the optimal blend of these to 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 yeah allow these performance benefits to actually be you know usable for for the athletes so i'll just stop my screen there and happy for some feedback in terms of what we're what we're doing well i mean yeah again i'm like everybody else i love gadgets and technology etc um you know, and, and th these things are great. And, and again, every, you know, is this the next step? You know, is that the, the, the next step from the football up? Like, yeah, I remember days where, where people brought the Batac system and other systems like that for people to react to. Now it's getting increasingly realistic. And I know we've got virtual VR systems out there as well. But I still think, you know, to a certain degree, it's, it, it's always possibly, I say always, potentially always going to be somewhat limited with the fact that there's no opposition pressure, you know, and the, the strain that that puts on the player's cognitive performance as such. And, and also uh, with that, and I know there's an example where they maybe are knocking a ball back and forth on it, but the, the, um, there's no, not the same level of attention maybe required to, de and when I say attention, I don't mean just focusing on the ball, but the attention uh, capacity to to process the speed of the ball coming in, how you're going to control it in relation to opposition pressure, etc., etc. Are you going to pass it on first time? Are you going to need to take a touch away into space, away from the defender first before moving it on? So again, these things are are always uh, just now, that, and that's why I always say that I think they're a great supplementary training tool, and and they obviously help. Uh, provide data for, for certain things, but we all need to accept there's going to be limitations as well. Um, you know, it's not going to necessarily replicate what the players are fully experiencing it in the field of play, I suppose. Yeah, and I think that the main thing is, is that we're not trying to replicate mm. uh, the, the environment. I think that 
they definitely has a huge amount of research in terms of, you know, how does VR possibly train decision making in referees or something like that. And this seems to be, uh, you know, a little bit more effective in terms of, you know, concrete researchers or research showing that it is effective and stuff. Um, and I, I think that what we are trying to do is we are trying to push the limits of technology in, in, mm. in terms of saying, you know, if there isn't a way to train football players to be better at football than just to play football, then we're most likely going to be the first ones to find it, to publish our findings and, and you know, and shoot ourselves in the foot. And that might be the case. But I think it's also important to, to mention that in the perfect world, they should just play football, you know, 11 v 11. And what's the point of doing anything else? But what I must mention is that there's a huge, uh, you know, interest in terms of, especially which the coronavirus has shown us is that, you know, a perfect world doesn't exist and they can't play that. And there are times where players get injured and have ACLs and they're out for eight months, you know, and they're worried about mentally not being as fresh, um, you know, could that be where the helix really pushes its you know benefits on and you know for a healthy player it's not so great we don't know uh and what we want to find out especially in a research manner is is you know the answer to this question is how do we use these tools to benefit our players knowing that we have the technology and the money to fund this uh, and how does it suit our style of of play and our philosophy of technology really integrating within our team do we ever suggest that everyone should buy a helix no i mean if that was the case then there would be more than four football outs in the world you know we don't push our technology on other people's budgets uh which is something that i do want to share with you a uh, uh, a low tech uh thing that we also have you know uh, used at hoffenheim um but I mean, I'll let, I'll let you guys respond to that first and then I'll show you our low tech stuff, if you would like. Yeah, no, I, th I think, again, you, you're right, you're you are trying to push the boundaries to see what you can do. And that's why I say, I always say it's great supplementary training to, to, to have a, a available. Um, you know, and there's too many, I think there's too many people that are, are quick to bash or say it's not realistic to the game, etc. Well, and I was like, well, what's realistic to the game unless you're just going to play 11 v 11 on a big field? Uh, um, so we're always needing to, to come up with, with a variety of solutions. Um, and like say, one of the things when I talk about technology is I remember years ago having a PlayStation. I used to play Colin McRae's Rally, uh, a game, uh, Rally Cars with a friend, a top game at the time. And we loved it. It would never, irrespective of how good we got at that game, we would never be rally drivers, you know. So, um, and again, that's not to take away from the enjoyment and the things that we maybe did get benefit from. But uh, the only thing that's going to make you a good rally driver to a large degree is getting in a rally car and, and going out there and experience it. Um, but you're not going to go in the hardest routes to start with. You're going to build it up and you're going to vary them. So I think, you know, technologies a great supplementary thing to have and like you say if you've got the funds and that's the kind of th thing that you can can try and push the envelope on you know i think a lot of people could could do worse than invest in those kind of things and i know there's other things you know different budgets like i've i've looked at lots of these you know the intelligym system where they've got different sports the neuro tracker thing you know there's there's been lots of things that have come out um and uh, you know they've all got pros and cons all got pros and cons yeah i mean we're not saying that every player should play fifa uh to be a better <laughs> football player but a lot of players do play fifa, do play FIFA. <laughs> you know i think the main thing is is that we're we're just i mean we're curious mm -hmm. we're curious and yeah. we're scientists and you know paul paul the guy that's doing his phd he's also an academy coach um and so, and he's a psychologist, so he's really all three things, which makes him the perfect candidate to really push this kind of research because he first understands the needs of his players, you know, and he also, as a scientist doing his PhD, he's also interested in pushing past the boundaries of, you know, the, 
the general playing, you know, or like you know, performance improvements or, um, or how do we improve players? He's also playing around the technology and he's a psychologist as well, which allows him to, to kind of understand motivation, player, athlete, buy-in, coach buy-in, you know, what's attractive, what's not attractive. Um, you know, how do, how do you actually engage players? Because if you just put them in the helix, for instance, and just say, okay, play, they're not really gonna grasp the concept of this. And so mm -hmm. he's kind of saying, okay, well, how do we get players to actually engage in this? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's really about motivating them. And if you need a little bit of gamification so that they feel mm -hmm. like they're in a FIFA environment, like who wouldn't want to stay in there for 20 minutes and then come <laughs> back tomorrow? Uh, and so, you know, it's this really, really fine balance of, of trying to find something that is interesting because most cognitive trainings are not necessarily interesting uh, or, you know, engaging for, for people. So we're really trying to push the boundaries of, of this expertise, but also standardization that we need for science, but also fun for athletes. Mm. Uh, and, and yeah, that's kind of the point of, I, at least I interpret that as the main driver of what motivates us to to develop this helix further. And and then obviously from a coaching perspective, you know, as a a coach, um, and then it's how does this then transfer onto the field? You know, and like we said, that's the million dollar question. But it's it's is that going to positively impact on the performance? when they're out there in the competitive environment. And yeah, and that will be one of the studies for Paul that he will look at, uh, you know, near transfers, far transfers in terms of near transfer being cognitive abilities and far transfers being potential um, on the field or even football now, for instance, as a starter in terms mm -hmm. of how well training in the Helix may have influenced uh, their performance gains across a certain amount of weeks. Um, but these things are all, are all, you know, subject to change based on our experience in the Helix, based on the tools that we develop in terms of software in the future. So, yeah, definitely for the people watching, make sure you refresh your uh, Google Scholar every now and then. We'll, we'll be sending some publications out, hopefully in the next uh, few months. Um, just going to bring in a sort of question from Tag Lampshi around eye tracking technology. Um, We'll sort of start with that with the work you'd be doing in the helix I mean, how much actual tracking of eye movement of of the players are you able to do within within the helix um, we haven't personally integrated eye tracking and i did i have done research at the moment uh, with eye tracking a few years ago uh, and i think it's definitely possible to integrate eye tracking. Of course, we, we can. We just we haven't ourselves done that yet. Will that be something we should do in the full in the the heat? Absolutely. Um, I'd also like to put the head movement sensors on the heads and kind of see how do people who are tracking the objects how do how do they compensate for this ability? You know, are athletes somehow tracking one player for a very long time and just anticipating where the other player is tracking on the other side or are they constantly switching between players? You know, um, these are all technologies that would definitely be very well integrated into this, into this. but you know, the Helix is very new. It's, it's still uh, under its first pilot stages with athletes. So we have to take one step at a time, but Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Whoever answered that question, uh, get in touch with me. I definitely would like to speak to you further about that. Um, well, yeah, we tag. I think the question then is going on a bit further. Um, and I think we're getting into that realization stage. We're using uh, Kevin's sort of from Kevin's presentation um, with the sort of eye tracking technology that there's things like players will use. The example is like a look away pass. So you don't always know what it is the player is taking in. Just because he's moving his head here when when making a pass you know, they can quite simply be looking just to throw as a substitute 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 sort of faking faking a, the opposition out um so as a as a researcher how do you when you're sort of looking at these head movements how do you account account for those to understand exactly what it is yeah so <laughs> 
every time I watch, well, every time I watch Thomas Nagaki, and he's he's one of the researchers that's the leading head movements in the field. Um, he gets this he gets this question every single time at a conference, uh, and basically it, he says, "Well, there is no way to to truly know. There is definitely room for deception in terms of deceptive." um head behaviors in terms of looking one way and then passing the other and i mean i'm not sure if he has done a study in terms of how do we integrate that uh that's a really good question and i don't think that there has been any sort of study that has actually answered whether what they're looking at you know are they perceiving information uh and we all know that our attention span is very low and you know if we were just because we look at something doesn't mean that we have understood what we are looking at. And, and I think we just state that in the limitations at the moment. <clears throat> um, yeah, but definitely one person for whoever answered, or whoever put that question is, is Thomas McGuckin. He would definitely have a very good argument uh, or discussion, I should say, about that uh, and how we should, uh, you know, really take that into account rather than just writing a simple sentence in the limitations yeah for mm -hmm. sure yeah i mean uh, and, and with that and uh i think that's uh tag that, that answered that and uh hi tag uh, i know tag i've uh, done a little bit of work with him in the past um the uh you know obviously <laughs> the thing is the, the no look passes those kind of deceptive moves uh just like feints when you're dribbling etc that they are going to be in a lot of the time the exceptional minority of the the head movements or the looks of a player. Um, you know that they're going to engage the visual exploratory activity far more often to take in information that they can act upon as opposed to in order to deceive opponents. Um, but it's obviously a very useful way of deceiving opponents, as as some athletes have found. You know, particularly in basketball, it's a particularly common thing in basketball um, uh, a little bit uh, and, and a little bit less so in football but you've seen you've seen players that, that have done it you know um, Ronaldinho was quite adept at doing it and Thierry Henry done a couple of good ones as well and so it's uh, yeah again you're never going to be able to answer that question is were they were they looking at that to take information from specifically where the fovea was or, or are they are they looking at that as a pivot in order to use the peripheral information or are they looking at that in order to deceive opponent um you're never going to be able to get a 100 percent answer on that apart from possibly the no look pass when it's executed so when they do look one way but put the ball the other you go yeah that's the reason why they look there and that's probably the only time you can almost definitively say the reason why when the no look pass actually happens so there's a question then here from Tag. So yeah, uh, I'll direct then at you, Kevin. Although we'll ask, we'll ask um, just say there, but Tag that the uh, yeah the research that Adam mentioned from from Thomas, I believe um, Gear sort of um, alluded to it in one of our previous Sunday sessions, which you'll be able to find on the Football Network World YouTube channel. So uh, I think yeah, but they were using. Um, we're using glasses within a within a uh, game situation. We're being a, a controlled game rather than in a competitive league league match. But um, yeah, I uh, think that would definitely be worth looking at tag, and uh, certainly definitely worth listening to. Then I think would be your uh, answer to one of tag's follow up questions. Then, which is for you, Kevin. Um, is there a risk of overemphasizing visual search behaviour in the sense of isolating it from the whole body? proprioceptive responses in terms of picking up auditory info from surrounding play, not to mention the way developed patterns of play help players sense the perceptual cognitive workload in time-constrained situations? Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think if, if we are completely detaching it from the environment, then, then yes, uh, I, th I think, you know, how you're going to you know, and but we use the, the crossing a road example. Obviously, that's a you're carrying a visual exploratory activity there. But as you've seen, 
people might do it when they cross a road because there's a very significant danger, but they might not necessarily do it on the field of play because the impact of not doing so is less significant. Um, so it's if you're completely detaching it, then it's what, what's the transference from the environment that you're training in to the environment that you're performing in. Um, so, which is again back to that million dollar question that, that um, Adam mentioned, you know, about the transfer. Uh, it's it's tough, but if you can make it uh, the, the fidelity of the environment that you're training in as as close as possible to the performance environment, which is again um, through you know lack of funding, I suppose you know, kept it low tech and cheap and accessible for all that you can affect it in a low cost way in an environment that's on the field while the players are still playing games, engaging with the ball and competing with opposition. Um, that's not to say there isn't, back to, I really value the supplementary training that, that Footbanauts, Helix, other um, technology may provide. Um, so, yeah, I, I think overemphasizing it when you're looking at detached, but I think when you're looking at where there's a good deal of fidelity or a strong fidelity from the, the training environment to the performance environment, then I think, I honestly don't think it can be overemphasized, but because I'm so passionate about this field, I probably would say that. <laughs> okay. Um, the research, Adam, is sort of suggesting that, all right, that the scanning is, is a key skill, but it is just a small part of a whole process in terms of receiving, which, which Kevin showed on in, in his research, in his presentation but as a researcher do you really just have to like okay I can only really look at one particular aspect at a time or do you see there's a time where people like yourself Thomas Gaia are going to be able to research and put this whole process together to see right this is how it works well I mean I would already argue that Gaia's research back in 2013 was that because he he just video camera really good players on the field completely uh, unaware that they were having their head movements scanned you always run the risk as soon as you you know put a head movement sensor on the player that they start trying to you know act what you know what what hmm. you or they think that you want from them so it's you know the Hawthorne effect it's called where they kind of change their behavior and start scanning, you know, everywhere. So that, uh, but I, I don't know. Because research really was that, and I, I think that's that's why it inspired so many people to start, at least in the scientific world, or or at least it inspired me to to jump on board. Was that, you know, this is truly a glimpse of expertise in. Uh, in a real gameplay, which is what we always wanted to revert back to, is real gameplay. And, and I think that our kind of research was only just supporting Gia, you know, Gia's research and just saying, okay, you know, these are just more objective measurements. Um, and our objective measurements can only really maybe complement Gia's research, but we should always go back to that and say, this is really what real game footage looks like. And I think that our science is only a conversation starter to go into clubs like Kevin does or go into FAs and just put numbers on, on paper or, you know, like we just want to go in there and say, here's some facts that we've come up with uh, that we can observe on a field in the football now, you know, in your trainings. Uh, and, and I think it's more just a supporting research, but, yeah, as Kevin always says, it has to revert back to the game. Um, and I, I would say, yeah, Gia's research, we should just do more of that, really. <laughs> that should be the next step, is more of that. And I know that Thomas, uh, his, his research, I'm not sure if it's published yet, but it was putting sensors on every single player uh, on the team, so in the real 11 v 11. Um, and just seeing what happened. And I, I'm almost positive that they did publish that, but it's, it's a really good paper to read because that really is the highest fidelity, you know, with, with the highest objectivity that we can get in terms of using sensors coupled with real gameplay. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's going in that direction. So I, I'm pretty happy and I'm sure that everyone else is in the research too. 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think like like we keep saying, Gears, uh, you know, it's the seminal paper on on this subject that, that really brought it. Uh, again, you know, obviously, I, th I think unfortunately there's still this um, little bit of a detachment between the researchers and the practitioners. Uh, you know, the the practitioners aren't always getting access to this kind of research uh, and and information. Um, but I think. Um, you know, when I particularly look and then I think about, because his work was a big inspiration for me as well. And and I've, I've actually recall collect, correctly, I'm going to recall this, I'm, I'm sure that it was, it was Tag that, that showed me the paper because um, Tag was doing some research at the time and, and, and doing an MPhil um, in a related field uh, with football. So it was, it was him that, because he knew about my interest, he, he told me about this paper and I managed to, to track it down and, and, and it was great. Uh, but the, you know, the, the, the way that study was done, like you say, as soon as you tell people, they start, it starts influencing their behaviour, you know, without it necessarily being positively, just so they can up the stats. There's a, a, an anecdote about when the GPS systems to track movement and training sessions, etc., was first introduced at rugby clubs as they went professional somebody was running back and forth during the, the team talks, it said, why? To boost his stats. <laughs> you know, it wasn't game performance, but it put his stats up. Um, but that was, I, su I would suggest that, um, you know, Gears and initial research, with it, certainly with those players, that's back to this level one aspect of the scanning because we haven't investigated the meaning that the players took from what they saw. Well, the comprehension, obviously, we've been able to go, well, those that scanned a lot completed... 77% of passes, those that scanned were well, low frequency, it was only 39%. So you could, you could say that, yep, uh, well, okay, they obviously understood, understood more than them, but did they? It was just that their visual exploration was lower, you know, so did they have an opportunity to, to see the pictures they really needed to see? So back to the scanning is the, the gateway, the comprehension, the, the realisation, the level two comes next. And that's that's a far harder one to be able to study in situ or even afterwards, because even the answers that a player will give you, you know, are going to be impacted by whether what they did was successful or not. You know, so that becomes a, a real tough one, I suppose. Fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. I think uh, time has caught up with us. I think that's a, uh, a good spot to, to wrap it up today. Um, and leaves us open for chapter two, level two. <laughs> yeah. I think I'd like to revisit this topic specifically um, at least once a month. So maybe that's, that's one for, for October's discussion around uh, training player, player perception. Um, so yeah. So I just wanted to put this on just for the guys listening. Uh, about some of the emails that they can follow up this with. So, I mean, they should have both mine and Kevin's, but these are some, some experts in the field of, that we were just discussing. So I thought I would just give them, you know, a, a, a next actionable step that they can take into pursuing their interest in this area of research. Okay, fantastic. Thanks a lot for that, Adam, and for all your input today. No, no, thanks for having us. It's uh, It was a fun and definitely different Sunday night. Normally they're a lot more relaxed, but I think I'll go have uh, a beer and celebrate Hoffenheim's win over Bayern now, so. <laughs> yeah, go do it. Oh yeah, I thought that'd be uh, your average sort of relaxed Sunday conversation about coaching uh, training perception within within the football nought and helix. No, not your normal Sunday afternoon. <laughs> That's normally uh, that's normally uh, a Monday morning conversation, I'd say. But hey, time zones, <laughs> as Kevin said, you know, what's Sunday night here is Monday morning in Australia or something. So uh. that's how it works. Yeah, we got you on Australian time for Kevin. I guess this is like an everyday conversation for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm chatting about to people about this all the time, and uh, so you know. Thanks for having me on to chat about something that I love and being able to engage with Adam. That was that was great. You know, I think uh, 
uh, you, you know, t technology is, a, and I know I keep using the, the supplementary thing, we all agree that, that there is value as a supplementary training tool. And I think we all agree this is something that's important that, that we, we help our players do. So this is one of the best Sunday nights I've had in a long time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> wow.